OK, so um, it's time to let your trousers down. Let's face it, we all have a couple of secrets. Yeah? Um, everyone has a secret. And I'd like to invite you to participate in a simple experiment right now. I'd like you to think of one of your secrets. Just think it about it, conjure it up, the image in your mind. Now, we tend to think that these secrets are secret. Nobody knows about them. You would think that because it's in your mind doesn't mean that your neighbor sitting next to you can understand or know about your secret. And that's what I want to challenge here. I want to ask the question about whether your privacy is real the way you feel it. Now, your secret might be something mundane. It might be something simple, such as, for example, the pin of your credit card. It could be something embarrassing you don't want people to know, for example. It could be that you enjoy watching funny cat movies on the internet. Something like that. So is it possible to read out these thoughts? Um, well, in fact, we can tell about a person's mental states to some degree about their feelings from their body language, from the expressions on their faces. If you look at these famous Ekman faces here, um, you can see that our facial expressions give away what we feel, uh, but this is still severely limited. If you look at the person on the left, obviously she's surprised, but what is she surprised about? What is she looking at? What is she hearing? What is surprising her? We don't know. We can't tell this from the surface of the body, from the body language and from the face. We somehow need to go deeper. And deeper here means we need to go into that part of the body that encodes, that stores your thoughts, and that is the human brain. Now, I'm a brain scientist, and for many years, brain scientists have established fact after fact about the brain. And one thing that's always shown up is that our thoughts are intimately related to brain processes. So it should, in theory, be possible, if I put someone in a brain scanner, to find out what they're thinking. The question, though, is how do I know to interpret the language of the brain? I somehow need to translate it. I need to, when I want to read it out, I need to some understanding of the way the information is stored. So a simple analogy can help us here. Um, and we can think of the way in which information is stored on the surface of a CD. How does this work? Well, it's the pattern of pits on the surface of the CD that codes a piece of information, say, for example, about a piece of music. One piece of music, one pattern on the surface, a different piece of music, a different pattern on the surface. And this is very similar to the way your brain stores information. It stores your thoughts in spatial patterns of brain activity. So how can we read these out? How do we know what the spatial patterns of your brain activity are? For this, we use so-called brain scanners. It's a technology known as MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And it basically involves very strong magnetic fields. It doesn't do you any harm, but it gives you a quite well-resolved map of your brain activity. So that's what we do. My job is people come to my lab at the Charité here in Berlin, and we put people in brain scanners. We read out their brain activity patterns. And then we get something that looks like this, a brain image. Now, don't confuse these brain images with photographs. They're not photographs. They're not like an accurate, perfect depiction of some spatial event. What they show is a spatial map of probability. Uh, it tells you most likely this part of the brain is involved in some kind of thought. You can see some regions that are uh, hot colored, red, orange. They are regions that become more active than usual when you engage in specific thought. And the cold areas, the blue areas, are where the activity is lower than normal. But what does this specific pattern of brain activity mean? Does anyone know what this person is currently thinking about? What do you think? It's difficult. It doesn't say on there, this person is thinking about the Brandenburg Gate or something like that. It's not written in there. Instead, it's an abstract code that the brain uses. And this is something that's quite familiar to us. We know this. People faced this problem over 200 years ago. In fact, when they encountered the hieroglyphs. People 200 years ago were puzzled by the hieroglyphs. They didn't know what the hieroglyphs mean. They saw this on the pyramids. Some people must have said, that must be like a pretty wallpaper. But instead, others might have said, I think this actually means something. But, but what does it mean? What do you think this means? It's a very similar problem. What does this mean, like the brain image? You can't know. Well, I can tell you, this one here means brain, as you might have guessed. But how do we know this? 
I don't have any ancient Egyptians in my family. How do I know this? It's because people stumbled on a translation. In 1799, someone found a translation, the famous Rosetta Stone that you can see in the British Museum in London. And this famous Rosetta Stone contains a text in hieroglyphs and a text in ancient Greek and Demotic as well. That wasn't quite so much of interest. So this allowed us to translate the hieroglyphs into ancient Greek, a language that people did know to understand. Now, this now makes our task very simple. All we need to do is we need to find the Rosetta Stone for the brain, right? Sounds easy. So where is it? Where do we have to go and dig? Do we have to go and dig in North Africa or in um, Southeast Asia? Where is the Rosetta Stone for the brain going to be? Nobody so far, unfortunately, has found the Rosetta Stone for the brain. The reason is, is that it's very, very complicated, much more complicated than the hieroglyphs. And we need to use something different, something called code breaking. Now, in the Second World War, the Germans thought they were particularly clever um, by encrypting their messages on this famous Enigma machine. They took a military text, they put it through the machine, and out came some scrambled version that nobody could understand. Then, in the U-boats, they would find the scrambled text, they put it through their machine, and out they get the real message. This is what you can do if you know the code. But the British were trying to decipher it, but they didn't know the code. But instead, they invented brute force statistical techniques that allowed them to translate this hidden code. And that's what we do today with brain images. We try and understand what the thoughts are a person has. So how does this work in detail? I'll just give you a simple example. What you can see here are three images on the left the person was looking at inside a brain scanner, the Brandenburg Gate, a bouquet of flowers, and a German shepherd dog. On the right are the corresponding patterns of brain activity, and you can see they're very different. Every thought you have has its own unique signature pattern of activity in your brain. You think one thing, you get one pattern of activity, you think something else, you get a different pattern of brain activity. And now what we do is we train computers to recognize these patterns of brain activity. If I know to recognize the pattern of activity in the top right, I can tell that the person is thinking about the brand aggregate gate similar to recognizing an individual based on their fingerprints. If I find the fingerprints on either of them in a database, I can use a software to detect the fingerprints out of the database. And that's what we do. We train computers, we train them to recognize these brain activity patterns, and then the computer has to prove that it's worth its money, or the program that we write is worth its money, that it can decipher what you're thinking about. And then you give the computer some pattern of brain activity. You might not know what it is, and the proof is if the computer can correctly tell what you're thinking about. This works remarkably well. If you do this simple game, you get an accuracy of up to 100%. You get it right almost every time. So this is for people in brain scanners looking at visual images. But you could say, well, if someone's in a brain scanner looking at an image, I just have to look at the image they're looking at, and I know what they're thinking about. So, we need to go one step further. The next step is, we just have them imagine an image. We put them in a brain scanner, we get them to imagine various things, say, for example, watches, hands, faces, all sorts of stuff, and we measure their brain activity patterns. And we can decode what they're thinking about based on pure imagination. They're just, it's just in their mind. There's nothing in their environment or in a computer screen that could give it away. They're just thinking about it. And this works incredibly well as well. But you could say, this is still rather academic. Let's look for something even more interesting. What about people's behavior, their decisions, things that are relevant? So we went ahead and did a number of studies where we tried to look at people's decisions. These were decisions, very simple decisions among a few alternatives, for things with either completely irrelevant, such as, for example, do you want to press a left or a right button, or things that are a bit more relevant, for example, do you like this car, do you want to buy it, or do you like this car, do you want to buy it? So we read the brain activity out of their brains. In the first case, we looked after they've made up their mind. So people make up their mind, we read their brain activity, we try and decipher and tell which choice they've made. Yeah? So every one of you make a choice, say, for example, between wanting a BMW or a Mercedes. You make your choice, can we read this out of your brain activity? The answer is yes, with pretty decent accuracy. The next question is, however, what about 
the choice itself. It, you're more or less free to choose between one or the other. What made you go one or the other way? So we looked backwards in time before the decision, and what we found was that you could, to some degree, predict a person's decision, a free decision. They can choose either alternative before they actually feel that they're making up their mind, up to seven seconds before they think they're making up your mind. So you think you're deciding now, but your brain has at least started preparing this decision seven seconds before. How is that possible? Well, it raises an important riddle, and that is that we normally think of the sequence of events when we make choices is we decide in our mind. We don't tell anyone, we just decide, and then we use our brain to put our body into motion, for example, to tell people what we're thinking about. But this says it's quite different. This says the brain starts preparing the decision, and then your mind comes in a few seconds later, and then you start moving and doing things. This is quite different, and it raises lots of interesting questions. The most important one is, who's responsible for the action? If your conscious mind comes after the decision presumably has already been made, how can you be held responsible for the action if you commit a crime? It was my unconscious brain activity that happened before I made up my mind. I'm not, it's not my fault that I committed this crime, you could say. So you can see there are lots of interesting questions raised here with respect to free will. I'm going to leave that as an open teaser. I'm going to focus on a different question. If you're interested in that, go to our website. Um, I'm going to ask a different question, and that is, can we read people's minds in a technology that is similar now to these stage acts that people did in the 19th century. What you can see here is a depiction of a stage act. A magician uh, draws a person from the audience. They come on a stage. They're blindfolded. They think about something, say, for example, a shape or a person, and the magician can magically read their mind and draw their thought on the board here. Can we now replace this stage act by something new? Can we put a brain scanner on the stage and then the famous brain scanner, you put people in it, and it shows you on a board what they're thinking about. Is this possible? The answer is, to some degree, but not that well. And I'll explain to you why. First of all, there is severe limitation with the resolution of brain scanners. They have a resolution of a few millimeters, so that means in every one of these small measurement volumes we have, we have up to a million nerve cells. That's a lot of nerve cells in one measurement pixel. So basically, we need to increase the resolution of these brain scanners so that we can get down to the activity of single cells if we really want to read out the full details. But there are even worse issues than this, just the resolution. One big problem is that every one of you has their own signature brain language that stores the information. You can see here four brain activity patterns for the same thought in four different individuals. They're all different. Everyone stores the information different, which explains why we have such a hard time understanding each other if our brain activity patterns are so different. And so this is a severe challenge. So we can't train a machine on one person and use it for another person. It doesn't work that well on the second person. Another problem is that preferences and thoughts change, and the brain language presumably changes as well across a lifespan. When you're young, your favorite movie might be Lassie, your favorite food might be a hamburger, and the favorite music might have been heavy metal. Come on, we're talking about secrets here. That's your secret, my secret. <laughs> okay, when you're older, things might change. Now you like schmaltzy Austrian movies, you like salad, or at least pretend to yourself that you like salad, and Bavarian brass music. Come on, admit it. So the problem is, that the brain activity patterns causing this kind of information change across the lifespan, and we've got no way of dealing with this. But now the biggest problem is that we can think so many different things. One of my favorite sentences is from Monty Python. It's called, my hovercraft is full of eels. Who would have ever thought uh, that someone was going to think this today? If you programmed a computer to predict what you might be thinking about today, I'm pretty sure my hovercraft was full of eels would have been very low on that list. So, we need to be able to account for these situations as well. We can think so many different things. We can think a whole dictionary full of different things. So we need a dictionary to translate thoughts into brain activity patterns, and we don't have this dictionary. So what could this look like? 
Do we get a subject to come, we pay them very well, they come for 20 years to the brain scanner, the first day we start reading the dictionary, we begin with Apple, and we continue, and after 20 years, we're finally done, we're with Z, we're start reading Zebra, etc. Is that how we measure the brain activity patterns for all these thoughts that they might have? Well, luckily, we can take a shortcut. And the shortcut is that the brain has arranged the information in a way that is easier for us to understand. And that is, it uses principles of similarity. And I'll explain to you how this works. You can see in the top right a hypothetical brain activity pattern while a person is thinking about a car. And the bottom right, a hypothetical brain activity pattern while they're thinking about a bike. But now we've measured our brain scanner a different pattern, but it looks like a mixture for the pattern of a car and the pattern of a bike. What could that be? What do you think? Well, it's a motorbike. So you can exploit these principles of similarity. You don't need to know what every thought looks like in the brain, and you can still read out a large number of thoughts. Now, there are a number of technical issues ensuing from this. For example, potential lie detectors or brain marketing. Lots of people are interested in commercial applications or forensic applications of this technology and medical applications allowing people who can't move their bodies to suddenly move and control computers and do things like that. Now, there's a big debate necessary about what of these technologies we want and what we think is ethically um, uh, feasible. But one important question people are always interested in is, does it mean that now you're open to manipulation? Well, don't worry about that too much, because first of all, it would mean that you could have to put someone inside a brain scanner. So to some degree, your thoughts are private. If you're just walking through the world, nobody has a mobile brain scanner that works remotely, you can think about your PIN of your credit card, and nobody's going to be able to read it out. Don't worry about that. Now, it, one thing that people are still quite interested in is whether you can be manipulated. Manipulated here means, is it possible to write thoughts into a person's brain, to make them think certain things, as you can see in some science fiction movies, like in Strange Days or Inception, etc. The answer is, today, this is not possible. And the reason is that the way our thoughts are coded in our brain is in very intricate, fine-grained patterns of brain activity. It's really very, very lot, lots of detail in these brain activity patterns. And to date, there are techniques for stimulating the brain, but they're very diffuse. And there's no technique available that would allow us to write these very detailed patterns of activity into the brain. So, brain scanners can be used to read out a person's thoughts to some degree, and don't worry about the technology, and especially, you don't have to worry about people programming thoughts into your brains. Thanks very much.